Uh, who has? Does everybody introduce themselves? I think so. We're good. All right, guys. I'm Bo Eckstein. I um, I uh, host these meetups, I guess you would say. And my day job is I'm a hard money lender. I work for a management company in um, Concord, and we manage street funds. And then I also have my own company, which lends in 46 states. Um, and our niche is we can do stuff outside the box. A lot of the uh, hard money funds are more, you know, they have a little box you got to fit into. They'll do 80% of purchase, 100% of rehab, but we can also include an interest reserve so you don't have to make payments and things like that. I also do seconds, construction loan seconds. We'll use the finished value and we'll go up to 65 or 70% of the finished value. And we do a lot of big construction loans on spec homes, ground up. So that's kind of our niche. Uh, although we're going to start doing a lot more smaller deals because the market's probably going to change here pretty quick. Uh, it, not, not too bad, but slow down a bit. Anyways, um, hi Gina. Oh, we got one more person. Gina Landers, you got to introduce yourself. Oh, no, I don't. No. You know me. Hi, I'm Gina Landers, and I'm a friend of Bo's, and I'm a real estate broker, investor, and I'm here to support everyone and learn. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now everybody's introduced themselves. Okay. So, um, there was a group of guys that I met in Sacramento and somehow I was telling somebody they just do a lot of big deals. And, and then I got introduced to you last year at a mastermind group. And, uh, I always try to bring really good speakers that are doing a lot of deals that, uh, are in multiple markets. Cause a lot of us here are, we might invest here, but we're also looking at other markets. So I wanted to bring somebody that, you know, has a lot of experience and a lot of background, has won some, has lost some, and um, has construction management experience and is doing uh, ground up deals, big deals, and also doing a lot of fix and flip. So I think he's got a good kind of flavor of what's going on, and, you know, nationally. And what we were talking about earlier is um, kind of like where I'm changing what I, for me, is like, I want to wake up and not have to go to work, right? Like, I don't want to have to do hard money loans necessarily. I mean, they're great, you know, but um, it's great if it's your own money that you're lending out, but when you're just, you know, getting a commission or whatever, it's, you, you got a job still. I don't want a job anymore. I want passive income. I want to, you know, live the flip-flop lifestyle, as we call it. And, and uh, so, so, you know, learning about different markets and, and what's going on and, like, what you can do, you know, like today I... Put an offer in on a triplex for thirty-two thousand dollars. That needs about ten thousand in work, and that thing will pay me gross income is about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars a month, right? So it's like, you know, the, the Midwest. There's opportunities, and wow. you're not going to get the same appreciation, but like knowing I can create a baseline of uh, passive income, and then I can kind of like start working on bigger projects, and and then we we all network here, you know. Uh, Ryan's a good numbers guy, so I'm not a good numbers guy. Even though I do loans, that's simple. But, you know, analyzing big apartment complexes. So it's good we have this kind of connection here. We can kind of learn from each other and keep growing. And, and hopefully, you know, uh, people that haven't done a deal here will do a deal eventually. And it's really, I mean, uh, what, what I see is uh, I just did a loan for a gentleman who was buying a fix and flip. And he's buying it from a wholesaler. And the guy that, uh, my buddy that's buying the deal, the wholesaler made $100,000 on this deal because he just bought it that, that good, right? $100,000 with no money, no credit or anything. So it's like, it's out there. It's like whoever, you know, if you're door knocking or you're chasing no and notice the faults. I just did another deal today for a guy and that's what he does. He door knocks NODs, notice the faults. It's crazy, but a lot of us need to take action because that's the whole key. And also, you know, don't, don't speculate because, you know, uh, don't, you got to be realistic with your fix and flips and things like that. But there's a lot of money to be made and some of us will make money and some of us will lose money. And so, so hopefully by learning from guys like this, we'll get their kind of global view on the market. And, and he studies a lot of economics and all that stuff. And, but I'm going to have him introduce himself and kind of give you his background of, of, you know, where he was, mistakes he's made where he is now, the markets he's in, his viewpoint on flipping and then also multifamily and development. And uh, without further ado, Jake, take it over. Oh, you don't need this. Okay. All right. It does work. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, I got it. so. Uh, yeah, uh, Bo, thank you for inviting me out. I mean, it's uh, uh, always shocking to me that people want to come and hear what I have to say. Um, but, uh, you know, I actually do this quite often, uh, a, a bunch of different events in, in BizNow and some state of the markets uh, in some of the markets that we operate in. So I kind of what I want to do is kind of spend you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes kind of giving uh, my background, where I am today, where it led me up to this point, and then really kind of open this up to questions and answers because, you know, I, I am not a celebrity as much as I like to tell my wife I am. Um, so, but in, instead of me just, you know, throwing a bunch of information out there that may not be pertinent to everybody, I want to, to answer specific questions for you that may give you some actionable items that you can take today from something that, that I've learned uh, and, and experience. And, and if, I, if I don't know about it, then obviously I'm not going to BS you and as far as doing something or ex trying to explain it. So. Uh, I started investing, actually, so I was uh, at a retail business. I did trophies uh, in uh, glass etching at a couple retail stores. Uh, I started that kind of post Army. I was in the Army, I was an air assault infantry um, NCO. And so the, after that, I, I got into this retail business. And I thought, you know, at a very young age that, you know, if you're a business owner, you're just going to kind of skate in and people are making money for you. Well, what I realized is that the retail business, you're kind of a, a slave to the customer. And the, the more stores, the more, and especially a, a very uh, minimum wage employee is that they're unreliable. And you, you know, you're, if you're the last one that's uh, you know, responsible for that, it's a very challenging aspect. So, uh, and actually as I was then transitioned into National Guard and uh, somebody gave me a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it was, so that book I read, uh, and it was, it was that kind of light bulb moment that it was like, yes, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And so that started kind of really a lifelong journey uh, of diving into research and, and reading books. Uh, and, and I mean, honestly, I, I try to read between 50 to 60 books a year. I would say probably 50% of those are real estate books. And so now over the course of that, uh, of almost 20 years of real estate investing, uh, I, I've got into the hundreds of books. And, and so what you'll find is through experience and through those knowledge of, of what somebody has you know, put into a book, you start seeing similarities, but then you see nuances and seeing things that, that trigger uh, maybe in something that didn't make sense five years ago that starts making sense on a deal today. So uh, that's kind of really where I started was uh, studying that. I, I got after uh, into commercial construction. Uh, there was a, a gentleman that was a real estate developer. I'd sold the retail business. I started bartending at a golf course. I thought it'd be cool to be a bartender and also didn't have the money to join the country club. So, uh, but it was where I could network with other people. I could get into groups kind of like this and get to, to find out what other people were doing. And so this, this gentleman, uh, I would ask him. I was, I was 23 and I said, hey, I'm ready to go grab the, the tiger by its tail. I want to do this real estate. I want to do development. Uh, and he, I said, what do you do? How do you do it? And he said, and give me a, a, a very insightful uh, advice. And he said, the guys that learn it from books, go to college, you know, get degrees in finance, come at from a finance or, or kind of lending perspective, uh, we'll learn. And then, but they're going to take some lumps. The guys that come from the trades, the guys that are contractors, instantaneously are successful because they know how long something's supposed to take. They know what it's supposed to cost. They know some of those nuances. So he's like, if I was you, I would actually get involved in construction. And so, I played golf with a guy uh, and I, I was very persistent and so I got a job as an estimator for a commercial construction company. I didn't have a construction management degree, I hadn't even finished college, but I was persistent and, and you know, so ultimately what happened with that is he wouldn't hire me because I didn't have that degree and I, I, I didn't have uh, the experience, but I told him I'd work for free because I bartended you know, three days a week, I had another four days that I could work for free. And so be, being the fact over the course of several months, I, I pestered him and played golf with him and asked him about the position. I finally said, hey, I'm just showing up Monday and I'll do the job for free. 
he ended up paying me because he said, hey, you're, you're really persistent and my wife says the same thing and that's probably why I'm married to her now. But ultimately, so that's one of the, the kind of characteristics that's kind of been a thread that I've looked back over the last you know, 15, 20 years of investing is, is persistency is one of the things that's kind of set me apart. A lot of people give up, kind of flash in the pan, but then they don't stick with it long enough. So as that commercial construction, I did really well as far as bidding jobs. And I did a lot of stuff here in the East Bay, in, in Walnut Creek and San Ramon, um, Pleasanton. And so I worked uh, on project for equity office properties, which is Sam Zell's uh, big REIT. And so they were buying mid-rise office buildings and we were fixing them up. And so I was 23 years old. After I landed some of those estimated positions, I started working into a superintendent position and then a project manager. And so I had a hundred and 30 subs working for me between seven buildings all across the East Bay and it was one of the most maddening things I've ever done in my entire life. It was as you know most contractors and being in the contracting uh, the trades it's kind of like adult babysitting. Um, you just kind of have to get them to do what they're supposed to do and you have to follow behind them and tell them to do it again and do it again and do it again and not do this and and, and so and that's kind of one of the things that I've learned and early on that, that I think gave me a competitive advantage in, in real estate. Uh, from that time I actually started, uh, I bought a house, uh, I was flipping some cars, I would go to uh, some of the auctions to Mannheim and Brashes and buy houses down in Arizona. At a, at a discount and bring them up here to California and sell them and make you know a thousand fifteen hundred bucks a car well when I happen to be down there an extra time I looked at some of the real estate well the real estate and brand new houses were a hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollars brand new houses I'm sitting up here working out of the East Bay and this is early 2000s you couldn't buy an outhouse for hundred and fifty thousand dollars and so then it was like that Again, that another light bulb moment when I said, wait a minute, maybe I can go buy something here. I can actually afford this. I didn't think I could afford a house because it was five hundred, six hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 for houses locally. So that's what I did. I went and bought a house and, I, and there was a, a community, um, Westgate uh, was where the new, uh, it's now the, the University of Phoenix Stadium, the Cardinal Stadium was gonna be built. And so there was this master plan community. I'd seen what happens when a new development comes in and what that does to real estate prices. So I bought a house and I fixed it up and I would fly down on the weekends and fix it up and fly back. And that's kind of how I started learning. Fortunately, unfortunately, I actually got in a pause because construction is really, really difficult here in California, the permit process. So I was supposed to manage some shopping centers and build them, but we were in this infinite delay of, of the permitting process. So they said, we don't have any work for you for six months. We're waiting for this. And so we're gonna let you go and we'll call you back. And I said, well, no, I'm good, I'm out. And I moved to Phoenix. Uh, that's where I kind of really started flipping and it was just on my own money, my own credit. I happened to be in a very fortunate time in, in an environment where it didn't matter what you did, what you paid for a house, you made money on it. I was buying houses and just by delaying the close of escrow, I was making fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 buying it at retail and then selling it retail to cash buyers. And it was just kind of a crazy uh, time in the world as far as that subprime boom that was driving it up, uh, I became a millionaire before 30. And I was, you know, that was my goal. I was very myopically focused on that and persistent. I didn't go out, I didn't make friends, I wasn't persistent, it was all about doing deals. Well, as that kind of happened, as most of you guys know, 07, 08 happened. I was levered up to my eyes. I was, you know, out there, I had 15, 20 houses, I had rental properties, I had negative cash flow, I had, Lost it all, every single last thing. So what happens, I was coming to closing table, I had money, I had cash, but then I started, because I saw it coming down, I didn't know how bad it was gonna ultimately get, but so I started coming to closing table with $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. Well, the checks kept getting bigger and the houses kept depreciating more and more, and then I ran out of money and I still had houses left. So ultimately, I, uh, I got foreclosed on the last couple of houses. I tried short sales, I tried deals, and got foreclosed on. And so what I had amassed of becoming a millionaire before 30 had lost it all. And so when I, it was actually a very, 
education. Yeah, educational, but it was it was kind of a, a holistic, introspective time. You know, I was overweight. I was probably 50, 60 pounds uh, overweight. The the girl I, I dating that I thought I was going to marry, you know, uh, broke up with me. My my siblings that were helping work with me said, "Hey, you're an asshole, Jake." I'm out of here and they moved back to California and so for me I sat down and it was like what what did I do well what did I do wrong and so really and to me a testament of it was I felt like I was lazy I didn't keep going I didn't I achieved my goal and I kind of let off the gas I stopped doing it you know I had enough money I could have just sold and, and, and sat for a very long time with millions of dollars and had success and, and, and actually Bought a lot of discounted properties when the market crashed, but I didn't because I kind of rested on my laurels and, and, and it was about expanding myself. So that really was that took the next level. And so for me, there was another book that was very instrumental, was the, the Four Hour Work Week. It actually just came out at that time. So Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, and I, I mean, I lived it. And it was, and what people, if you don't know or you're not familiar with a book, it's, it's how do you work four hours in a work week? Well, it's not four hour work week. It's how do you 10x your productivity? How do you take what you're existing and, and, and expound that and, and, and do things in an exponential way? And so from that, I, I created, I lost weight. I, you know, got back into, and I mean, really, because I lost everything, I got back to my roots and I got back to construction. I got back to, I'd do anything, you know? So I had, uh, I moved back here up to Northern California um, and I'd take, I, I fixed fences that blew down in windstorms because, it, it paid money and I ended up moving back in with my mom. I was 30 years old living in my mom's spare bedroom overweight you know div you know not divorced but uh, broken up with and as far as and so to me that 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 foundation of rock bottom was where I then started and I started doing construction uh, started making some uh, ends meet my college roommate uh, ended up working as a VP of finance for a, a big large land developer. So the guy, he built a home building uh, company. Uh, he built about 10,000 homes. He sold that off to Lennar for three, four hundred million dollars. Somewhere in that, they, they wanted him. And so he ran uh, Lennar's land division until about 05 or 06. And so he had taken his 300 million and JV'd on, on many master plan communities all throughout kind of the Sacramento area. Well then, as he was sitting on the sidelines from 05, 06 until about 09, he said, hey, there's blood in the streets. And so my college roommate called me up and said, hey, Jake knows how to flip houses. Let's start flipping houses because they needed cash flow. They were concerned that some of their partners were gonna start failing. Some of their shopping centers that they owned. CMBS and debt just disappeared off the planet. And so there was like, how do we, if we have to buy out our partners, where do we have our cash flow? What do we do? And so when that opportunity came in and we started and we started flipping houses. We went to trustee sale. We went to the courthouse steps. And it started as a couple houses. Maybe we're going to do 50 houses in the first year. Maybe we're going to do 100. Maybe when we started doing it and we we're doing a couple hundred homes a year. Then we started aggregating some single family rental portfolios. And then over the course of uh, about five, six years, we did a little over 700 homes uh, that we flipped and then started putting into single family rental portfolios. The fact that the market corrected and then actually some institutional investors, so people that are familiar with Invitation Homes and Colony, Wedgwood, uh, they came in and so even though we were successful and we had these margins, they had billions of dollars. So those billions of dollars and compared to our millions of dollars didn't really uh, cause, you know, it, they ate our lunch. They kicked us in the teeth. They didn't care about us. And, and I was explaining a little bit earlier, they have a different model. And so that's where I've gotten really good at is uh, diving into the details and understanding. So Jonathan Gray runs uh, Blackstone's real estate arm. He's one of the most brilliant people in the real estate world. You can ever hear him talk or hear his thing. I hope he comes out with a book at some point. But he has, and I go, he's running this. He's one of the smartest people I've ever you know encountered how is he coming in so they're buying homes so for instance maybe in Sacramento there are two hundred thousand dollar houses market value and they're coming in and paying two hundred and twenty two hundred and thirty two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a home and I said you know it just didn't make sense to me how can these people this fund come in and buy over market value for for a house it just didn't make sense to me as I started peeling back the layers of the onion what happens is that they were buying on a 
previous peak price. They said, hey, the previous peak price on that home in this area, in the Sacramento area, was $400,000. We'll pay 75% of that previous peak value. So they said, hey, we're paying up to $300,000 on that house. I don't care what market rate is today. So when we realized that they have billions of dollars, they're playing on a different matrix, they're playing in a portfolio, we said, we can't compete. So we kind of closed up shop where we kind of dwindled down what that operation was. Well, over that time in doing 700 homes, I said, hey, I've built up kind of this experience. I had some of these institutionals, some of these rental funds really started targeting me and wanted me to run their acquisitions, wanted me to go out and do this in other states and other areas. I said, ultimately, I want to do this for my own. And so that's where I took out. And then three years ago, I went out on my own. I partnered with a wealth manager and we started flipping. And I said, this skill set, I think we can prove it out and utilizing technology as we can flip in multiple markets in multiple states based out of California. So in that time, we've done a little over 300, we've about, about 350. We typically have about 50 to 60, 70 in inventory at any given time. And then there's processes that we've established during that. That was kind of the start and the foundation of our company. Uh, so we're a private equity. Uh, real estate company, that opportunistic distress is what is, is kind of the main driver and the kind of the day to day. And it's really a hamster wheel. And as you know, flipping is as soon as you flip, you want the next one in. And it's just a repeated process over and over. So what we did is we had then our other asset class and our, our investment thesis is development. And so then that comes down to a dirt value, a construction value, and then ultimately the, the value in which we can sell it for. And so that's kind of our, our second leg of our stool. And then the third is value add uh, income. And so we buy primarily an urban core, we're buying commercial assets and, and a, doing adaptive reuse or, or modernization plays for, for income. And so those you know, historic buildings in downtown, in Milwaukee, in San Antonio, in Austin, in Cincinnati. And so each one of those has some synergies that uh, overlie uh, of our other strategies, but what it's done is it's given on us, uh, uh, tapped into a lot of different markets that gives us and see similarities and things that are, are different. The fact that we're flipping so many houses, we see what's going on in the market at any given time. We have the pulse, and so that also helps us determine some of our development that have these longer window and, and development cycles to do we need to start tweaking them? Do we need to exit earlier? Do we need to start speeding up this process? And, and so in you know, combination of that is we found some things that really work well, and there's also the flipping market does fantastic in a recession. So the development deals do really well in growth economies and when consumer confidence is going up. And But there's also the, the risk is that you're going to sit on it for three years or five years and how are you positioned for that? And then the income, and as I was talking to Bo earlier, sometimes that's really good because it's going to give you cash flow that's coming in month after month that then supports your other businesses and the other legs of your stool. So overall, that's where I am right now. We have about... Um, I don't know, 15, 16 people working for us. We have offices here in, or in Sacramento and in San Antonio. Um, but most of what we do is remote. We, we've utilized technology for the technology's sake. Um, we can comp properties anywhere almost. We're, we're, we work on, on the Pareto principle. How can we get 80% of the results off of 20% of the effort? So there's deals that we miss. Of course, there are some things and nuances of a market that you might miss that that side of the school or that side of the street goes to a different school district. But we can kind of figure out some of those. Where are those production home buildings? Where are those subdivisions? What are the things that are really making sense? And then we kind of keep waiting. What's the catch? What's the catch when we look on these other outside markets coming from California? And what we found is there's sometimes not the catch. So overall, that's kind of where I am. I want to kind of open up the floor to questions. Uh, I know if Bo wants to give the mic so everybody can hear what the questions are, and then we can kind of go from there until you, you, you tell me to stop and go home. Okay, great. That, I like that. Okay, so my, fir my first question is, is um, if you were an investor with limited cash, but you wanted to kind of go into a, a market other than California where, you know, you're, you're, you want to play on a, a cash flow play, you want to buy like, you want to start small, you want to buy single families, rent them out, duplexes, fourplexes. What are your top three markets that you think would be, you know, even during a recession would be uh, sustainable? Um, 
and you know have a long term probably good you know a lot of job growth and such sure so i mean one of the things is so some of the investor limited partners that invest into some of our funds their number one thing that they say that they come to me is capital preservation i do not want to lose my money this is a portion of my life savings that i'm trusting with you i do not want to lose my money so because that's the primary driver that in the lens in which we we focus is it helps dictate what deals that we're going to look at so California has big oscillations in prices you can make really big you know uh, returns Phoenix you know Vegas some of these Miami you can make really big returns but you can also lose a lot of money so when we actually put that as a criteria of a lens of capital preservation we actually focus on markets that were actually a lot flatter as far as so you look at Midwest you look at down south and so they don't have these huge spikes up and they don't have huge spikes down and, and really that comes down to a an economic kind of supply and demand where are the people moving how many homes can they build or residential units as a whole if that it translates to uh, multi-family or single family or, and then kind of jobs and so we look and we track and we broke it down to really a, a four-prong criteria number one is that population growth is it improving declining staying flat what does that look like what's affordability average home price to average income so because if that average entry-level house is hundred fifty thousand two hundred thousand dollars and the average median income is forty thousand dollars those people can afford houses all day long we don't see that going trending down significantly uh, uh, job growth and so with that between the uh, how many new jobs are coming into the area there's some markets in in Louisville looking what happens in Milwaukee where Amazon's HQ to go some of those things that are driving new jobs retail the world has been changing significantly with the Amazon but what's beneficial of that is just because you order everything online doesn't mean that you don't want your stuff and so the logistical aspect of that is where is Amazon locating some of their distribution facilities how close are those to those major metropolitan areas and then one of the other things that we're seeing is an urban core Kind of an urban renaissance in the country over so when we look at that as far as to get to your question and actually the, the final prong of that the, the fourth one is demographics is what are those jobs so when we actually ran this out in early i don't know what year it is right now so 2014 2015 so those four prongs affordability job growth population growth um north dakota had it in spades crazy but when we later in the final one of demographics <coughs> what does that job makeup look like what is your exposure to it well it's completely related to the the energy market all that job growth all of that population all of that income growth was related to the oil industry and so we said hey not that we predicted the the decline of the the, the oil price but we said if it does go down you get sunk in those markets and so that's what we're looking for is diversity and so when we look at those markets obviously the south were re really strong on, on Texas uh, on Georgia but also now some of these Midwest cities and down in the urban cores I mean so you look at Louisville Cincinnati I know some people have mentioned that we haven't done a whole lot of stuff in Indiana uh, but there's markets in there of these around major metros that are doing really well and, and they're strong you're not going to get it spikes in value but you're going to just be steady eddy you're going to protect yourself and you're not going to have them fall off so i look at those markets i mean you can buy houses for ten thousand dollars in some of these markets so you can go pay cash you can screw up and do a lot of things wrong and through a lesson that you would maybe pay ten thousand dollars to have go to a class to learn about real estate well you can go do that you can at least get your money back out of it you can actually go make mistakes and maybe you lose five ten thousand dollars but it taught you something so there's opportunity and it's margins you can go buy something and have a 10 20 cap in Ohio and so why not focus on those as far as for opportunity it layers in a whole lot of other problems how do you remotely manage contractors how do you get people to to do what you need them to do and so utilizing some things like technology so thumbtack angie's list um, home advisor looking at those and don't use craigslist by the way do not use that's just like playing russian roulette with with your money so you need to have some verification of those uh contractors you've seen that they've done 50 
five star reviews. Here's the comments on them. And what we've also found is we don't give jobs full remodel jobs to anybody until we've established a relationship with them. So you go give them a $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 remodel because they say they can do carpet and paint and granite and everything else. Well, what happens is you get in and they suck it, you know, 75% of it. It's done. It's terrible. And then you got to redo it and tear it out or they just ran off with your money because you gave them a deposit for $10,000 and they said, hmm, that's actually more money than I will make on the profit of actually doing the whole entire job. So I'm gone and then you never hear from them. And then how do you pursue them from another state and there's different contractors? The vast majority of states in the United States do not have contractor's license. So it's just somebody that has a truck and a hammer or calls themselves a contractor is a contractor. So that's something that was very eye-opening. You're just like, what are you talking about? You can just, anybody can show up. Not licensed, not bonded, not you know insured. So those are some of the things that we've broken those down into Painters paint. Flooring people do flooring. Granite guys do granite guys. Cabinet do those. And so it takes a little bit more logistical elements of it. But then you have some redundancy and people are looking over each other. And then we have someone and we actually found better to have a professional photographer go take photos of it than individual trades. Because with a high quality image, because of what you can do, they don't know what they're supposed to be looking for. Where the painter might be able to say, hey, yeah, I can take a picture and the certain angle that they're taking it at, you know that you know the cutting in is garbage and you go through it, but when that professional photographer comes in and they take their wide open lens and it's high quality and you can zoom in, you go, hey, what's going on in that corner? And you scroll through it. And so those are some of the things that we've started to utilize hundred dollars you can have somebody go through and take professional photographs of, of the progress that's coming by weekly we will not pay you until you're complete and then we have a verification of those and then we've broken it down into those individual trades so that we can then create those aspects that allow you to do something remotely i've taken people that have no idea how to do anything within construction do the and follow these steps they can now become a contractor or a construction manager project manager for that so out of your um, out of your sixty, let's say you have sixty flips going right now. What's the ratio? Like, where are those? Where's the majority? What's the you know? Is it forty percent, fifty percent in San Antonio? What's your kind of breakdown of where your 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 single family stuff is right now? So I would say fifty percent is in Texas and Georgia, because that's where we primarily go to trustee sale. So the reason that we go and, and primarily focus on those is they have Super Tuesday. So Super Tuesday is the first Tuesday of every month is trustee sale for the entire month and every county at the same time. And so it allows us being remote from California to aggregate, to do drives, to do title searches, to, to get in and research all of this. And then we fly out there with a, you know, pockets full of money and go and buy as many houses as we can buy. The other 50% are sporadically scattered all across the country wherever we're finding a deal. So we have a few in Delaware, we have a few in Maryland, we have in Indiana, we have in Pennsylvania, South Carolina, North Carolina. Fortunately, the uh, uh, hurricane missed us. And that's part of the other thing is that now we have every kind of weather thing that opened up. We have hurricanes and you know hailstorms and floods and everything else. And then you're just like, so it's constantly every day you can look at it, something's going on in the country that causes you, you know, kind of worry. But that's part of the game. And then we've started aggregating it as a portfolio. So what we understand is, is 80% of the deals are gonna do what we expect. 10% are gonna outperform what we expected. And 10% are gonna do worse. And so what, but what happens is we're going to regress to the mean. And so even though, and so we're going to do 150 houses this year. So we're going to regress to the mean. So some of those did really, really well. Some sucked and we lost some money on some of them. We overspent at auction. You know, the rehab got crazy. We had to, a hailstorm came through and we had to replace the roof a second time. The HVAC took a crap on us. There was a foundation issue. All of those things get layered in and they didn't do as well as we anticipated. So um, overall, I mean, really, we'll do deals wherever we can make money, where we can make a margin. And so we target, we're, you know, most of those we're targeting 75% 
70 uh, at trustee sale, maybe 78% because we've aggregated some contractors of, of market value. And then the rehab and what we're estimating the rehab adjust our, our margins. And then we're just trying to do scale and it's a velocity of money game. How quick can you get out of this? Get back on the hamster wheel and do it over and over and over again. So um, for your single family business, you're buying like 90% off the steps. Is that pretty much how you run? Or are you doing any strategic say 60%. marketing? So how do you get in your other deals? Primarily um, REOs, um, but a little lot of online auctions. And so these, these kind of secondary tertiary markets, there's not a lot of people competing for them. It takes you, you have to go through a thousand auctions before you can get it. What, what submarkets are you in in Texas and Georgia? So we're in all four major metros. So, you know, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin's challenging. We have some ground up projects, but well, we're heavy in San Antonio. That's where our other office is. And then a few in Houston. We actually pulled back a little bit, you know, and that was actually because of the oil. And we were kind of seeing how that played out. And then we kind of dipped our foot back in and we picked up a few deals. Um, fortunately, none of those got in that hurricane either. Um, so, I mean, we, we really target deals anywhere. We have some Tuscola, Texas. I don't know where that is. Repeat the question, please. Uh, so the, the question was if we're going outside the Atlanta market. So we, we target four counties in Atlanta. So Gwinnett, Fulton, DeKalb, and um, Atlanta yeah, Atlanta Metro. And so then we picked up a few in you know obscure areas. I have a, a personal rental in Augusta that I've never been to, but you know, it's, it's good, a good return. I actually went there to the masters this last year. I didn't have time to go. That was having too much fun. Um, I didn't make it to wherever that rental property was. Go ahead. So do you do most of your investments out of the state of California? Is it mostly like in the South and in those type of places where property values are low? Because I, I do a lot of Bay areas and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how can I be, uh, competitive in this high market because you know how here is very high. I mean, but you still can buy a property if you can get it, if you can find it, five hundred, six hundred thousand, and maybe okay, it's, the comps is going for maybe eight fifty, but you got to put one hundred fifty thousand in there. You know, you got to kind of work with with that. Like, how do you find those deals? Because I might find one or two out the whole year. I might do two hundred thousand, but it's just one or two. How do I? Get them coming in like just fully. I, I, what, what type of strategy do I need to use to make sure I can get those type of deals coming instead of, instead of okay, but riding my every neighborhood, taking pictures of property, figuring out who the owner is, and then writing little letters and just hoping, hope, hopefully they might call me back. You know what I mean? Like sure, yeah. So we we actually don't do very many in California because of that that issue is we need scale, and so we do we. As they kind of come through, we'll do maybe a couple in California as a whole, but it's just so competitive. There's so many guys chasing that deal. There's so many people door knocking stuff. There's people doing, and that's actually how I started. I started door knocking notice of defaults. And so I would get people and have them uh, assign me, uh, you know, subject to give them five grand and I'd assume it or, you know, start paying it. And, and so that's kind of where I came from. But it doesn't really exist. And so when we say there's there's these multi-billion dollar funds that are doing this and they're playing on a much different level, how do you compete with that? Well, for us, we can't. And, and so it, it becomes a lot more challenging because then we look at that, we can't sustain our business doing three deals or five deals a year. So with 15 employees, we have to do volume, but we also have to understand and predict what we're gonna do. And so we'll do, you know, uh, those hundred and some on houses, we make about $15,000, you know, to $18,000 on average per individual deal. And we're gonna do 150 of those this year. So, but that aggregates up. Some of them are gonna make 50, 75, $100,000, but some of those are also gonna lose money. And, and so, and that's just for us, it's a velocity game. It triggers a lot more and it gives us more insulation. So those $500,000 houses still exist in other markets, but they're a lot harder to, to sell. There, there's less buyers in that pool. So basically you said just move to those particular areas. I think there's better opportunity now there. I know you don't have to move there. I live in California. I do deals all over the country and I don't ever like, 99% of the houses I have never been to, I have not been to the state, never seen it. Actually, some of these systems, you don't have to go to them. 
You don't have to see them. You don't have to, you know, and obviously if you're just doing a one, one man kind of operation, you can manage that through photos, through contractors, through technology. You can do all of those things. You can make better margins and better profit doing outside of California. Okay, so that's what you do. You just pretty much, so you're scared. So basically what you're telling me what you do, and, and I'm just my last question. Sure. You're from California, so you just send contractors or talk to contractors in that particular area. You, you find a, a unit or a property that you like. You get a, you, you put the people together over here to manage your property, and, and you trust them to go there and fix it up and make sure they have everything together. And you just trust them based on, you know, you never met them, just by based on their cards. And, and, and so we, we buy the deal first, uh, then we find the, the contractor. Then we find the agent and we play a, a flat fee. You know, we pay him a thousand bucks. And that's a lot of money for you know, some of these markets. Some of the people push back, you know, maybe we pay him 1500 bucks. But in some of those we tap in and now we become uh, their top, they become a top producer because they're listing 20, 30, 40 houses for us in a given year. And so they hit and there's a benefit for us and benefit for them. Thank you, sir. No problem. Yeah, well, one, quick, one quick thing I had to add. When you're going into a new market, there's going to be a learning curve. You know, you're not going to just go there and make lots of money, probably. So you, you're going to you're going to get <laughs> you're going to have to figure out how things work. Like for example, when I started working in Indiana, not in Indianapolis, they move very slowly. Like I'm used to my title officer, escrow officer, getting us really quick. There, it's typical that I don't get a response for two or three days. Okay, that doesn't happen here. So you got you got to learn. You got to learn that. You got to learn like the different, you know, property tax rates and how they assess taxes because it's all messed up there. It's just a different world. But once you pay your dues, then it can be really good because where else can you buy something for thirty thousand dollars to get a thousand dollars rent, right? And and you know, so that's that's the opportunity. So when you go into a new market, so you just said, okay, I buy the property first and then go find the contractor. So what's your process of finding the contractor? Sounds like you'd like to do sub it out and do subs. So first of all, are you bringing a, a project manager that like you find somebody to, to oversee things for you? And number two, how are you finding your subs? So primarily our number one and probably 70, 80% of where we find uh, contractors through Thumbtack because they have to pay to be on the service. They have to, they have review process. And so we have in-house our project managers that handle that and they understand our systems. So we don't have somebody local there. If we can onboard a con uh, an agent that we maybe work with, that's obviously we can utilize them as a project manager, we'll pay them. But we've actually found, like I said earlier, that uh, a, a photographer, digital photographer, home photographer say, hey, I'm gonna have you come out to that house. You're gonna go out there four or five times. So I'm gonna pay you a hundred bucks, 150 bucks per week when you go out there and get an, a, a status update on that. We require that the contractors take photos of their work that they completed with that, but then we're gonna, you know, verify it as well and so that you know that often times and so we've had guys that you know you look in a photo and the carpet looks good and then you show up and it's like they you know they didn't actually know how to do the carpet there's no pad under it and, you know they 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 didn't tape it nor you know heat the seam and so you come in you're just like what is that and you have to tear up the whole entire floor um, and, and so those are some of the things that the high quality digital photographs that we've used to check on that the project manager sometimes it is, and we've used some, where they're more of a handyman. That So there's gonna be things that, some of those individual trades that a painter can do, that a, that a you know, the granite guy can do, that the, the flooring person can do. And so, but what happens is then we need somebody to do all the other things. Put in the door stops, make sure all the light bulbs are changed out. So we may utilize them as a, a project manager. So come in and say, hey, give us full list of all the things you think wrong with that house. We establish our budget and say, hey, we can do this, 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 and this. And that's gonna get us good enough to list it on the market. And from them, and then they go do all the odds and ends and they check up and do a final kind of, uh, final punch list on it. And so we give them a punch list. And so we have, you know, every door has door stops. You know, every light bulb works and they're the same type of light bulb. It just, it's kind of insane that you'll have some of those CFL sums, another one's an LED, one's a different color, frosted, this one's clear, and it just kind of looks, um, 
it costs you nothing to do that, but it gives you that little bit of edge uh, overall. Uh, we use uh, Task Easy on a lot of stuff for uh, main, or the landscape because they're doing uh, Task Easies. You give them an address, they took a, a, a Google uh, Earth view of your yard and can and give you a price and say it's going to be. $32 a week to, to mow your lawn and we'll put it on in a weekly and they give you update photos and it's just you know a process. So that's where technology has been hugely beneficial. Redfin, you know, utilizing local MLS comps, finding out the values, and then that thumbtack is probably so those are like the number two, number one and number two things that we use for outside uh, of California market. There's a few others. I have a friend here that has Padhawk. Uh, Padhawk is a software system that you can get and dive a little bit deeper into if you're doing title searches. I actually have hired someone away from a title company that does our own title searches in house. So that's where there you can get because there's liens. There's very challenging, uh, complex issues sometimes that you can get yourself into um, if you don't know what you're you're doing and looking for. And so sometimes those just get crossed off our list and thrown away because they're too complex and that, uh, we don't know what that state's laws are going to be. So one other quick one then. Sure. So if you're using Thumbtack to go off and do your subs and everything, are you, are you still, are you bidding it out or are you do that the first project or two and then you find people you like and you kind of stick with them or how, how are you doing? Yeah. So if we're in a market that we, we kind of establish some prices um, that, so we base on some square footage prices. Here's what we'll pay on a square footage for a paint price. Here's what we've established some, Hey, this is the same carpet that we're using across the country that's at Home Depot. And so we, we target some of those and pick some SKUs that we can repeat and do in multiple markets. So we know what we expect from the material perspective. And then we say, hey, I'm gonna pay you this amount of money to you know install this or paint that or do whatever. And then we kind of average that out. So I know what it's gonna cost me for granite or for, for flooring or for paint. And that's the vast majority. And so when I say that we're looking at the Pareto principle, that's what we're looking for. We're not getting into these heavy remodels that we're moving walls. We have a handful of those. We have some in Atlanta where we're tearing the roof off and, and expanding it. We have one in down in Tucson where we're spending $120,000. But that's where those are the, the anomaly where we're gonna go make a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but it might take us six, nine months, just because we can kind of need a little bit of those, you know. But vast majority, we're looking at 1999 and newer homes. We're looking where in a, in a track subdivision, we're looking at where we can go in and paint, carpet, clean up. We're basing our remodels on a budget on a square footage price. This is a 2,500 square foot house. Here's what we're gonna figure out you know what our budgets are and that might be twenty five thousand dollars for that and then that's kind of going to drive what we're going to do sometimes you walk in and it's beautiful most times it's not beautiful and you're going to have to do and figure out what what uh what's going on inside there so you i mean you purchase sight unseen first and then you find your contractors but in between that step i mean there's got to be or in that process, there's gotta be a step where you at least kind of estimate what the rehab is gonna be. Like, how does that process work? So that's usually like, if we have somebody that's, um, uh, that kind of handyman guy, or kind of someone kind of go through and assess or take photos, is that we're gonna go through and we can see from those photos what's going on with that. Let's replace the kitchen. Let's, the floors are, you know, hot pink. Let's not keep those, let's throw those out. Sometimes you get in there and you go, wow, it looks really nice. Let's actually, instead of painting it our standard paint finish, let's just touch up and redo that existing paint color. Let's do some of those things. And so, yes, we're establishing, we're gonna come up with what our list is of what we need to do. And then that's how we bid out each individual of those trades. So if it's already got granite countertops, we're not gonna tear out granite countertops to put in new because it's a, this color, you know, a St. Cecilia versus a Baltic Brown or something like that. Yeah, and I'm sure, I mean, you know, eventually you get to a phase where you have things down to kind of cost per square foot for things like, you know, different elements. You sure. can kind of, you know, get a ballpark. I guess, how do you avoid the situation where you buy something and then you send out, you know, your, your you know your crew to get you an, uh, an estimate and find yourself in the position where it's just going to cost you way more than it's actually worth how do you avoid that um the vast majority of them are going to be at the number but we found oregon is insane for contractors so if anybody wants to do to do work up in oregon you can just 
print money up there because all the dispensaries uh, are, are just paying obscene amounts of money. So we have guys coming in, they go, hey, I'm gonna paint your 2,000 square foot house. Normally we're paying a dollar, dollar and a quarter uh, price. You know, so we would pay you know, 2,500 bucks to have that house painted. Well, they come in there and they're $12,000. And you go, what do you, no, I'm not paying that. I'm not paying $12,000. I, all across the country, I've done a thousand flips. I've never paid that price. But what happens is that they're just so busy. There's limited amount of contractors. So that's one of the other things that we found is, is some major metro areas that have like 50,000 people or more have a little bit wider contractor pool. But for instance, so now we are very, very limited on stuff that we buy in Oregon because the contractors are insane. And so our budget was $20,000. We ended up spending $60,000 to just, we had to get it done. Um, actually, I was trying to get my brother to go up there because he's a contractor and fly him up there. And I think I could have saved uh, probably another ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for him going up there to do a paint carpet cleanup that cost me 60 grand. So you mean you're not going to leave that orange carpet? Hey, Mike. In? Mike, buddy. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, and that's a good point, too. There's a, guys, there's also a difference because he's, uh, he's got, you know, family money. He's got Uncle Vinny's money, right? <laughs> like versus us who are going there. We have to be a lot more careful. I mean, not that he's not careful, but they look at things at a global scale where we're just looking at three or four or five, six houses, right? There's a difference. They're doing they're doing volume, so they know the the 80/20 rule, right? That doesn't apply for us just getting started. It's different. It's a little bit different. Got to be more careful. Hold on, we got to go here and then we'll go over there. Are you using uh, software for your management of, of multiple multiple things, bringing you reminding you? Oh, I got to check up with this guy. I got to see what's going on with him. I got a draw coming up there. Uh, how are you? juggling multiple projects multiple contractors are you just leaning on in-house project managers or uh, yeah so software? that but we've also we have we've licensed a software program that's specific to that um, so like that pad hawk and, and I don't know what they're calling it now but it was my friend actually created it based on this for construction management you can actually track contractors you can remotely um, uh, let people into houses. You can know how long they've been in the house. So when the cleaner goes in there and cleans the house and then they check out, you know, and, uh, 30 minutes later and they say, okay, great. It's 300 bucks to clean the house. And you're like, there's no way that you were able to clean that. Uh, scanning in as far as taking, uh, uh, photos of, of the Home Depot cart and the receipt. And so actually one of the, the software programs that we started, actually we've been implementing it is Monday. So monday.com, it has a, a project management capabilities and has, I mean, a, a wide array of it. And, and so it, it's, it's, that's always a, a process, kind of a, a CRM, a construction management platform that we use a different Salesforce kind of sucks. Some of the Microsoft project, we do a lot of stuff on spreadsheets, but we're trying to always constantly utilize technology to, to eliminate that. And then also, and so Mondays, at least based on the cloud, it goes through the app. We can see that and we can assign certain tasks to certain people and then it triggers. So when we sell a house, well, when you have this many houses, what happens when you sell the house and you forget to turn off the utility and they go live there for you know two months three months or they you know jack up the ac in texas because it's uh, uh summer 19 months out of the year down in texas and so you know those are things and so it triggers and, and creates some things oh did we turn off utilities did we turn off the the maintenance service did we do all of those things and that, those are all been because of errors that we realized that we all of a sudden said oh whoa why do we have a $1,000 utility bill for a house we sold three months ago? And so those are the things that, that the pain points that we've had to implement and, and create systems that remind us, did you turn off? And so then it's a task of one, two, three, we, we're big on checklist, just gonna go through a checklist and you can do this. And then, you know, Tasha is one of the girls that works in the office. Elaine kind of oversees that. Matt, our construction manager, each one of them tasks that are assigned to them. And then we go down and then we're checking up on that weekly. And so we hold weekly meetings that are we checking up and doing everything. And so at least if it gets slipped through the cracks, maybe we're catching it on that once a week kind of meeting. Hey there. Uh, just to switch gears a little bit, 
uh, the value add commercial deals that you're doing, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind speaking about the type of assets that you're targeting, and I know you said kind of urban core type stuff. Yep. And then if, um, maybe just give an example of like a project or two that you're excited about or that you've done like pretty recently and that you like. And just sure. Talk about that a little bit. So um, we like, uh, we actually are rolling out a new fund. It's called Iconic Fund. Uh, we're, we're targeting historic and architecturally significant buildings in downtown markets of secondary and tertiary cities. So Cincinnati, Milwaukee, San Antonio, Louisville, Kansas City. And well, because there's this urban renaissance happening, actually, and you see in a lot of these areas, um, suburbia is doing... So, and that, I'm gonna get into that as far as, uh, and so you see a lot of these suburban markets that are doing okay, but the urban core has actually appreciated 57% greater than suburbia in the last decade. And so we actually see that trending uh, in that way. So we have, uh, we, we focus a lot on mixed use. Uh, we have some multifamily. We're doing a boutique hotel down in San Antonio in the Arts District. Uh, we're really actually big on office right now. Uh, we think that not a lot of people are competing. Everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is chasing multifamily value add right now. And so we try to be where other people aren't. And, and because that, the cap rates are, are, are incredibly compressed on multifamily. Uh, but what we're looking at is the asset first, the building first. And we're looking at an intrinsic value of the existing you know, square footage price. And so we, we pick up something, if it's $30 a foot for the building, it looks nice, it, it is a good building, then what we can do is we can figure out what to do in that given market. So there's some markets that converting to multifamily makes a lot of sense, doing an adaptive reuse from office to multifamily. There's other ones where you maybe it's, it's a B or C class uh, uh, historic building. So we have one that was built in 1902. The this, this same owners owned it for the last 30 years. They actually, the owner had passed away. He was a, a dentist. He bought it when he was in town in San Antonio. His kids inherited it and it was in a trust. They lived, one lived in Hawaii, one lived in Oregon. They'd never been to the building. They never put any money into it. Even though it had decent occupancy level, it, it actually, it, it was stuck in the 1980s, 1990s. You came into it, it was really heavy, kind of looking as far as dark woods, you know, the pattern carpet, you know, drop ceilings. And, and what happened is that they then would trail the market in, in rents. So they would be a little bit of a discount to everyone else. So what happened in the, in the, the, the 08, 09, up till 10, 11, uh, a lot of the A space, a class uh, office, multifamily, anything in the urban core, they drop their prices to compete and they post a lot of the, the B and C class inventory and, and occupancy. And so then you had the B and C you know, asset class for commercial buildings start getting about 20% you know, kind of vacancy levels across the board. Well, what happens is then some of those people are buying some of that B and C class buildings, turning them into multifamily. And so they're actually absorbing some of that inventory through you know, uh, obsolescence, kind of a, a reconverting it. Well, what happens is now those class A rents are, are, are setting new, new peaks that five years into your lease is now they've gone back up to from 20 to $30 a foot. So that, that office tenant is now looking back at the B space and seeing, hey, who can modernize that? Who's willing to give me a TI budget? And so that's where we actually find is a fantastic asset class office that you can do a modernization, you spend some money on TI and you can then compete. And then we're looking at what's, what are we buying the asset for? What's it gonna cost us to fix it up? And then what does that compare for like a new uh, construction project? So for instance, you know, there might be $250 to $300 a foot for new construction costs for an office building. Well, if we can go in and buy it for 100 and put $50 into it a foot, we're all in with a building at 150 a foot, nobody's ever going to be able to undercut our value unless it's the other existing inventory. So that's where the primary driver that we're looking at is what is the asset, the intrinsic value, what do we cost to fix it up? If it's uh, office, multifamily, hotel, whatever it is, and then where are we competing? Because guess what? There's gonna be another down cycle. Where are we in com competition? Where are we positioning ourselves for rent and cash flow over the long term? And those are longer term holds. Don't mind me adding on, how do you, in, in kind of speaking to that, worrying about the next, kind of next down cycle, how are you thinking about structuring debt? Uh, and, and 
specifically about these commercial projects, and if you want to talk about hydrostructure debt on the, the, the single family side, as well, you can do that. Yeah. So we. We primarily use cash um, on the, the opportunistic stuff, and then we layer in some line of credits that we are then, you know, cashing out, kind of juicing that leverage. Um, and those are from the bigger, you know, kind of civic, you know, Lima One, uh, where we have five, $10 million kind of line of credits with them that we're kind of cycling through. We're paying 7%, seven around there, and a point, point and a half. Uh, and then we're getting 75%, 80% of what we paid for it at trustee sale or at, you know, and then, you know, pulling some of that money back out to go then redeploy that. And that's where it becomes a velocity game on the single family stuff. Uh, for the commercial, uh, we actually like uh, trying to get into the, the insurance money. That's for long-term holds. So bridge to permanent financing that the insurance money, they don't want their money back. Uh, they don't, they wanna lock you up for 10 years. They wanna, you know, get you some, uh, you know, where you can't go anywhere, but you're gonna have better rates. You're gonna be in the fives on a four and five on a commercial asset or an office building. You have to hit some set certain debt coverage ratios on those, um, but once you hit those, then that's, and that's gonna be above kind of $5 million in loan value that one to five million dollars is, is just a tough nut to crack. Not a lot of people are doing it on, on commercial properties. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna hit you with some pretty high fees and points. But then what we're trying to do is get out of that money if we're using it for bridge to get out and get it into some kind of permanent uh, financing. Obviously, the multifamilies is much different. You can use some. Um, I don't know. I don't think Fannie's doing it anymore. I think they just. You, Yeah, and so you can get into some of those money for multifamily. Uh, that's obviously, I think, the best money out, you know, uh, on the street that you can you can ultimately get. Um, and then those are, you know, it, it's a constant battle. It's a constant thing uh, as far as to find that that better debt structure uh, to lock those up long term. What we're really, really excited about is the opportunity zones. Um, so I don't know if anybody knows about the Opportunity Zone. So the Jobs Act and Tax Cut of 2017 passed by Congress is a, is a tax reform program. And so uh, the president signed it into effect in December. And so what it does is it created, it's kind of insane as far as you actually look at it. It sounds like a, a, a scam. Uh, but what it is is that you can take unrealized capital gains, invest into an opportunity zone, and you're going to defer your tax payment until 2026. You're going to drop, after five years, you're going to get a 10% reduction in your tax of what your capital gains would be. After seven years, you're going to get an additional 5% reduction in your tax basis. If you hold it in that opportunity zone for more than 10 years, you're not going to pay any additional capital gains on the asset. So now it, it is it's unbelievable for family offices, for generational planning, estate planning, that have been kicking the can down the road from doing a 1031 exchange. And it's any capital gains, stock, Bitcoin, selling your business, doing these other things where you have basis of nothing. And so now, it, it, there's going to be more money chasing deals than there are going to be deals. And it's going to be in these opportunity zones. And I think they're all going to club in and they're going to, even though that it's spread out and they say it's rural or low income areas, what we found is, is a lot of these downtown areas of these Midwest and secondary and tertiary markets. So you see it, it's in downtown Cleveland, it's in downtown Cincinnati, it's in downtown Milwaukee, it's all of downtown San Antonio. And so you look at all of East Austin, which is probably the hottest real estate market in the country, but it has some areas where you can invest, you can do ground up development, you can do adaptive reuse, and you have to park that money for 10 years. And that's where a combination of historic tax credits, low income housing tax credits, these preferential tax treatments are gonna take your returns, they're gonna juice them probably five to 8% on a deal over a time period of 10%. So that's what we're really starting to focus on is tapping into more of those commercial properties and bigger you know, numbers, because it's great to sell that house for $10,000 and you crush it and you make a 50% return and you make $5,000. For us, we're getting into that, well, we want that to be a $10 million asset that we then, you know, with that 50% returns, $15 million. Now, now you, you got a smart block over my head when you're dealing with the house state property. You said you can buy like $10,000, $18,000 each unit, you might get $18,000 uh, investment return off your investment. Now, Mark, do you get it cheaper? Uh, like when, when it comes to the material, you know that you, you build these houses up? Like so, so, yeah, the question is, is 
if we can buy them for 10, eight, you know, $20,000, we actually don't buy many of those houses. We know they're possible, they're, they're a grind. We're actually targeting mostly houses. Our average sale price is $220,000. Okay. So we're typically buying houses about 150,000. We're selling them at for you know, 220. So that's where, you know, again, standard finishes, production track homes built in 1999 and newer because then there's going to be less unknowns you know in that house it's going to have kind of standard finishes it's going to have some of those things and that's where we're working and how we can do that remotely is that we can get that Pareto principle we can do 80 percent of the results off of 20 percent of the effort but, but there are markets that you know i i was just talking to a guy to, uh the other day he's in texas and he's buying stuff for 20 to 40. he's putting in 20 it's worth 90 when it's done there's a lot of markets like that and that's the average home price there you know uh so it really depends on your markets, but kind of too, dropping it back, Mike brought up a good point. If you guys are just getting started and you're going out of state, you know, get a home inspection and do your due diligence. It's not, they ha they're, they're a little bit scaled up, so they kind of like know what they're looking at a little bit more. Cause you know. I'm going to Vegas, I'm going to Phoenix. Like what the gentleman was saying right here, you know, I was in Phoenix, I'm going to drive safe. Sure. Yeah. Line, line condos, Costco, Phoenix, Arizona, Chancellor, I was all through here. Vegas started first. And, and but then, like you say, the bubble dropped. But then whenever when I go out of state and I develop these properties, I pay them and I put the, <coughs> the, the carpet and paint and landscaping and all the you know the appliances, I'm still paying you know what I mean, a certain amount. Like you know, sure. if I was gonna buy a fish right out here, I'll put the same thing, so it costs kind of similar the same amount. But sure. Put it if I'm out here in California spending a lot of money on the store. I'm gonna buy a property for fifty thousand, seventy five thousand, one hundred thousand, and I still gotta put fifty thousand, seventy five thousand in remodeling the whole thing and if they work. It, it better be worth 150. So if you're gonna buy it for fifty, you gotta spend fifty in it, you gotta be worth be 150. Okay. Okay. So and that's and it, it has to do is get down to your numbers and you know what their cost is gonna be. Yeah. Frigidaire, refrigerator or appliance is gonna cost the same almost everywhere across the country. So what's your tip? What, what, what is, for your company, for, for, for how many properties you have? You said 900,000, I mean 900, you like vast majority. So I'm pretty sure you get decent discounts on your uh, contract costs, you know, with your developers and all the people. Okay, what is the tip of the like, Depending on the type of property you're doing, whether it's an upscale area property or if it's a rental where you you get rental uh, income and you just want to do a real quick job and get rental income versus trying to sell it to make the income. What is the template? Because this will help a lot of people. What is the template that you you have structured? You know that that works that you can fit in any type of uh, neighborhood that you, you go to. So it's it's going to depend because we look we drive every one of these houses. We look at the pictures before. You can typically tell a little bit of what the condition the house is going to be like from the outside, even though you can't see what it looks like on the inside. If the lawn's mowed, it looks nice, those people probably aren't a bunch of savages and living and cooking off a hibachi grill. However, I've had that happen. I had a beautiful house up in Elk Grove, half a million dollar house, beautifully landscaped. Walked in, there's a nice turret, you came in, opened it up, everything was gone. The lights, you know, the outlets were gone. He was living on a mattress, cooking in a hibachi grill, all the cabinets were gone. So you're gonna get those. And so part of that is the reality is you're gonna experience some of those. But part of this is we're just looking at a scale. Overall, the vast majority of them, 80% of them are gonna be exactly as we anticipate. And so with those photos, we can establish some criteria. Man, that roof looks like crap. We're probably gonna have to replace that roof. Roofs are a lot cheaper in other states. So in Texas, we pay about $7,000 to redo a roof. In and out. Here in California, $15,000, $25,000. Workers' comps, way more expensive in California. Contractors, when you don't have a contractor's license in Texas, you just guys got guys that go do it. Um, you're probably only gonna have a warranty as, as far as you can see their tail lights. Well, since we're in California, we can't see their tail lights anyway, so we're probably not expecting much. But as long as they got the roof done, we don't care. It passes inspection. Ultimately, that's kind of what we're looking at. Normally, when I'm doing an investment deal, they have a lot of cash. I got a lot of cash investors, you know. Sure. And they, they, they want a whole package together before I even send it to them. And it got to make sense to them. So I got to do a lot of stuff. You know, I take I take more time than what I really want to take. I want to be able to have some professional, uh, 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 something in place to 
career is I can say, okay, just by wide paths, like you said, worst case scenario, this is the tip. The roof is this, the landscape is this, uh, the paint is this, and, and, and inside, you know, basically, like you said, square footage, you pay for a certain amount of square footage, um, uh, a certain amount of dollars per square footage. All this together, this is the price. This is the template price that based by just based on just driving past this particular house and the square footage, I know it's gonna cost me this much. So now I can put that together, let's tie up the contract, uh, tell the, the, the new buyer here, hey, this is how much this is, this is how much it's gonna cost to fix this up. I can get it for this price, give me thirty thousand, you can have it, and I'm going by my well, there, there, there there is there is like like uh, there's software out there or just like you know websites you can go to that actually if you you put in your remodel where it is it's going to identify the cost specific to that location but if actually what would be good for you probably what you're asking is i like what david green does and, mm -hmm. and when he's going into a new market he goes and he builds he calls it his core four property manager uh and, and a realtor like if you find the he calls it finding the rock stars because we're not talking about doing scale right now we're just talking about you know the average guy going out and crushing it so that, in, that, in that component you know you want to find the best of the best do what david green preaches for guys like us that are getting our feet wet out of out of state right it's it's finding the best uh realtor property manager you find the good people they're going to have the, the contractors lined up they're going to have the right people where you can get your where you can get your first product where they're giving you good bids because they trust that realtor right so the, the realtor knows that hey this guy's real he's gonna buy lots of properties and 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 once you find a good realtor property manager they're gonna be able to give you at least a few so let's let, we can actually connect up I want to see if there's any other some questions and stuff like that because I know we had a, a handful oh. yeah we're actually right here so um, we can connect up offline I, I, I'll give you my email address and, and you're welcome to, to connect on that so you mentioned in 08 you kind of nosedived right uh, so you were riding high right and it, it wasn't going to end and it, and it ended and then um so you pick yourself up and you uh you go back to what you know you know construction and then you get back into it um at that point so i guess it's a two-part question the first part is did you bring on partners in your scale back up that's the first question and if you did i assume you did what sort of uh, partners did you bring on, knowing you have a construction background and that's kind of your expertise? What was the first, or maybe in, like the most important in that in that beginning transition up of a type of partner you brought on to uh, to work with? Sure. So actually, I started um, back on the thing almost more as a employee, and actually, so I started working with with the the. the family office. So I had the experience. I knew how to flip houses. I knew how to do the construction. And so I negotiated, I got a little cut of the deal. So it was, you know, cause I, I bet on myself hundred percent of the time. I'm going to bet on me and I'm going to, you know, double down on myself. And so what I did is, is I got a cut of those deals. And so I got uh, the listing, uh, I would get the construction work. And, and then I said, Hey, I'm going to, you know, show you the values there. He got the vast majority of it. Well, what happened? I knew he was getting me at a discount, but I was at a place and, and you know, where I was licking my wounds and where I'd do anything. So as I scaled that up, I was using his money. He was making the vast majority of the profit, uh, but I was able to kind of build and scale based on doing a little bit of work for somebody else. I did and I learned. And then the fact that he built 10,000 homes over his career and then ran Lennar's land divisions, like he was playing at a whole nother level than I had ever anticipated. And so where I got and I was nuanced into you know getting this chiseled edge travertine in the entryway and this you know hand scrape walnut flooring and and look at that value he's looking at it from a production home building on scale and how do you do this on a portfolio level and so those things I actually learned a lot from him and then it was how can I take this to the next level so when I actually kind of stepped out I started actually people started coming me because they saw that I was doing this and building some of these uh, portfolios using someone else's money. Well, then I wanted to leverage that skill set that I learned. And, and so when I did and I negotiated some deals and then I, you know, I saved up a couple bucks and then I did the uh, next deal myself. And then I did the next deal myself and I kind of got back to starting over. Well, then ultimately when I said, hey, okay, hey, it's five years, six years of doing this. 
I'm gonna, gonna get what, what my value is. And so I went out and I said, I'm raising a $10 million fund. I'm gonna raise $10 million of cash and I'm gonna take it and we're gonna go flip houses anywhere across the country. It's gonna be a blind pool and they're gonna be locked up for a certain period of time. What happens was I brought in some high net worth individuals, some people that had cash and they give me a half a million bucks or a million bucks. We go flip a few houses and I'd pay, I make them 28%, 30% return on a deal, and then they go great and they take their money and go do something else. So it wasn't sticky money. I didn't have, I couldn't build a business off of that. And so that's why ultimately we transitioned into private equity. And so what happens is I, I, I was fortunate enough is, is that a wealth manager where he had a lot of high net worth individuals, he was an RIA, which is a registered investment advisor. And so he said, hey, these clients are 100% exposed to the stock market. And back in there in the oil, you know, is that, so how could we take some of that money, put it into a fund that locks them up for a long period of time that then we can, you know, go do this. And so I don't have to go, go to committee to vet out any one of these deals. We just buy. That's all we're doing. Here's our buy box. Here's what we're doing. I don't have to get approval for anyway. As long as we have money, we have a debt. And ultimately we have almost an unlimited amount of money to go chase deals. All we're trying to chase is deals that fit inside our box and then we're trying to do as many as those as we can do on any given market. And so and that's where the money was important because I had the skill sets. I had the systems that I built that did this over and over and over and over and over again. And then it's, it's always the learning process and always an evolution. It's always learning different states, different markets. Everybody's gonna do a little bit, a little bit different. And, and obviously, actually, you know, some of these meetings and some of these mastermind things that, uh, that Bo and I, where we met, guys that are just doing it and you're just like, I actually learn more from my competition than I feel that, that they probably learn from me is that you see and because you're doing it you go, wow. I mean, I'm like, hold on a second, I'm gonna go take a note on that one and be like, oh, he's doing that. And so that's is, is constant learning. There's a million ways to skin the cat and, and to ultimately do real estate. Nuances, guys that are doing it, using investor carrot websites and pay-per-clicks and buying non-performing uh, packages of loans and doing that and aggregating. There's just a million ways to do this. And, and, and so ultimately is that's how we keep evolving and keep adding and, and it's changing. It's harder and harder to flip a house every single day harder and harder. Everybody's the next Chip and Joanna Gaines. And so it only takes, and there's only a limited amount of houses, and if they're willing to pay $100 more than you are, $1,000 more than you are, you don't get the deal and you're out. And you gotta go do it again. And so they may only make $10,000 on a half million dollar house. Does that benefit you? You, don't, you can't feed your kids off that. The fact that they're gonna lose money. So you have to look at where those opportunities ultimately lie, and that's why we found uh, outside of, of California is where we can just have some predictable uh, amount, amount of volume. Last question, man. You, 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 I love you, man. I love you. You, you answered all the questions. Listen, last question. As a private investor, what is your, what, what do you want to see as a, a, a new investor or a seasoned investor that, that, that has a property that maybe have a little equity in it or something? What, what triggers you to make you say, yeah, that's, that's a deal right there? What, what's the amount of money? What's the percentage? 75%, 80%, 90%? If it's a good deal, would you just 100% on it? If you see the value and the money there, what makes you tick to say, okay, I'm going to sign on the dotted line for you and have that, that, that bought cash for you in three to seven business days? So, so uh, uh, it depends on the market, depends on how much work. But I mean, I'd say 73 to 78% of market value. And then depending on the, on the, the rehab cost. So if it's half a million dollar rehab cost, then it's, you know, it's gonna be maybe 10% of market value. It, it just doesn't matter, it, it depends. And so, you know, as our buy box, you know, as far as so we're looking at targeting, you know, uh, some of these houses, 75 to 78% of market value, we can make our margins, we're gonna make about a 10 to 12% on individual deal by deal basis. And then it's a velocity. How quickly can we turn it? Our average hold time is 120 days. We turn that money three times in a year get those monies, recycle, redo, read again. And so and then we can tap, sometimes they take longer, sometimes they take less. Then we deliver to our investors, you know, 15, 18% uh, IRRs on their money. They're happy with that and they want to do it again and again and again. Okay, we got, we got time for like two more questions and then uh, Jake will probably stay for about 10 or 20 minutes and he's got to go drive all the way to Sacramento. So um, I know he's got a long day, so let's, uh, so this is for me a little more of a wrap-up question. So you're you're looking at a lot of markets. You're doing a lot of deals. What's your feel on kind of where things stand now, and how are you kind of hedging your bets on uh, the economy? 
So that's, that's, that's uh, I'm glad somebody asked that. So, and actually, Bo and I were talking about the, the other day, where we are in the cycle. So I speak at a lot of conferences. I was actually supposed to be in New York tomorrow talking to a family office conference uh, uh, for, for real estate. And so that's the question I think primarily is asked uh, across the board. Where are we in the cycle? Where are we, what, are we in late innings? You know, we're we getting ready to have the next crash. And so we look and, and for me, being the fact that I live this, it, it's real to me. And so I'm now, and actually I went back to school. I, I, I went and got, uh, I went to grad school uh, at FIU and got a degree in uh, international real estate and finance. And so, because it was like, I want to see this on a bigger perspective. The signs were there before. And so when we look at this and, and, and really, so I go back to a book. So uh, Ray Dalio's Principles. I don't know if anybody, if you know who Ray Dalio is, he's a big, he runs the largest hedge fund in the world. And so he lost everything by making a prediction and as far as saying, hey, what, what Reagan put into to policy, the, the US was gonna collapse, uh, we we're gonna you know, default on a bunch of, uh, international debt was gonna default to us and as, as an economy, we we're gonna collapse. And so he took bets on that as far as through his hedge fund and he got wiped out, he lost everything. And so when he came in, he said, hey, hey, here's what happened. Uh, I made my predictions based on my lifetime of knowledge. So my 20 or 30 years of his investing is he says the cycles of that. And so he's like, what I realized is I looked back 70 years prior or 100 years prior and this same exact thing that had happened, these economic you know, trends happened and this is the market responded in the exact same way. So for me, it was again one of those light bulb moments where it was just like, oh shit, am I only making and investing on my thesis based on my lifetime of investing? So I went back and I've studied every single cycle in the US that's ever happened. And it comes down to intrinsic value of the dirt. It comes down to how much the dirt is and then what's that value in which you can you know, derive out of that dirt. So back in the, the early Jamestown day, people were speculating on the value of how much tobacco crops could produce. So an acre of land, and I don't know what it was then, it was a $10 an acre. And then what happens is that it could only produce $10 an acre. So as long as you are buying it for less than 10, you are okay. Well, what happens is because there's so much money flooding into the market, because they were speculating on it, then people started paying 10, 11, or $12. But it could only produce so much. So there's a lot of laws that have changed over the the hundreds of years of the country, there's zoning laws, there's codes, but it now ultimately still breaks down to what is the cost of dirt and how many units, how many houses, how many whatever can you put and now there's some tax benefits, some other things that drive that and what we found is it's, it's the supply and demand. What are paying, people paying for dirt? How many residential units are out there? And then what's the flow of cash? You know, how much money is flowing into the market and when we look at those things, there's not an overflow of money. It's still difficult to get a loan. Even though there's some stated income loans coming back, the vast majority of the country is undersupplied. There's about three and a half million residential unit shortage across the country. So that's not all across spread evenly. There's some markets that are probably oversupplied that have some declining population, but there's other markets like in Texas that you cannot build houses fast enough. And so you're seeing double digit rent growth month or year after year. And so when we look at that, there's not an overflow of money. There's not an oversupply of the market. So there's nothing that indicates to us that we're at the end of the cycle. So that could be, and for our prediction is we're three to seven years from the next peak. If I had to put a number, I'd say five years, 2023 is gonna be our next peak price. And here's how and what I come up with as far as the, the understanding of that. I think the stock market's gonna correct. The stock market's gonna correct. People are gonna take their all time highs and they're gonna say, hey, I'm good, I, I wrote it up, you know, I took my money and then they're gonna flow into a next investment that makes sense. And it's gonna be probably crowdfunding in these opportunity zones. So crowdfunding is putting out crowdfunding deals and real estate deals are putting out double digit IRRs because they're mostly good sponsors and they're mostly good deals and the vetting process is really difficult right now. Well, what happens when there's too much money chasing not enough deals? Deals are gonna get done that didn't make sense before. You're gonna have things in these opportunity zones that through the tax benefit, juice your IRRs by five to 6%. 
You wouldn't have done that deal before, but now all of a sudden the deal starts getting done and then people are gonna build upon that and then speculate on the land value. And when people start speculating on that land value over what those rents, and, and it's gonna happen and technology can speed that up or slow that down. So maybe it's three years, maybe it's seven years, I'm not sure, but there's certain signs that come in. And when people are start paying over that intrinsic value for the dirt, then you know, hey, we gotta start getting out because it's it's the, 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 the uh, game's gonna end quickly. And then what happens is somebody's gonna poke up their head and say, ah, oh, shit, there's 5,000 too many residential units in this market and there's not enough people to take it and they can't afford this price. And so then that market collapses. And so what we also look at is this is not nationwide. So if San Francisco declines in the luxury market, that doesn't affect Texas. It doesn't affect Atlanta. It doesn't affect Louisville. It doesn't affect some of those other areas unless it's a systemic issue as far as an overflow of kind of the subprime. And so each time you've looked at REITs, savings and loan, subprime, national bank rollout, there's some vehicle that floods too much money that allows people to speculate that have no idea what they're doing. So when you see like doctors start becoming real estate developers because, hey, I made 10% last year on the thing, so I'm gonna go do it this year, that's when you start need paying attention. What's going on? And that's where we see as far as the cycle. And so we look at that as our legs of our stool, value, add, and an intrinsic value for cash flow that we know we can protect ourselves on that. Our opportunistic, our flip done does fantastic in the recession. We did 93% annualized return, you know, in, in 09, 80% in, in 2010. And so when we did that on a $10 million portfolio, you know, it was printing money. And so what happens is, so that's our hedge is that, and the reason we've done it and rolled it out across the country is a proof of concept. So when would the next recession happens on, on single family, we're going to say, hey, big Papa Bear, private equity need a billion dollars. We need a billion dollars and we're going to go do a thousand houses a month. And we're going to go do this and we're going to hit it really hard. And then so that allows us, and then that's where the development, you have to just understand where your debt is. We mostly do our development, we take them down with cash. We don't take out any debt on them until we're ready to, to do construction. And then it's a construction loan and it's a sprint to the finish line. And so that we can weather if the market turns, we're just sitting on it in cash and we can wear it for another three years or five years or seven or whatever. So overall, we're positive. San Francisco's kind of crazy because it doesn't apply to any standard matrix. You, people can't afford it. You, you can't, the average home price, the average income, you can't afford it. And so what you're really speculating on is the international buyers, the tech people, Miami's very similar to that, New York's similar to that. And so we actually don't do a lot of stuff in those because it's, it's boom or bust. You can crush it, but you can also lose a lot of money. And again, back to our primary driver is capital preservation. We don't want to lose money, so we're going to just go play in those other markets that are going to trend along with inflation. So. All right, we got one more question. All right, you already asked one, but is there anybody else? Okay, you got it. You gotta buy me a drink then. For acquisition, do you ever, or have you ever used wholesalers? Why or why not? Yes, um, but rarely. So most of the time they're unrealistic in their uh, valuations. Uh, they, they buy them or you know, tie them up at too much. They wanna make 15 grand on a house that we're gonna make 15 grand and do all the work. And so, but they're gonna use the top end, the best comp that's ever sold in that neighborhood. They're gonna underestimate their rehab cost on, on the thing. And so then you get in there and you look at it. And so we're averaging out, again, those appraisal principles. So yeah, there might be one awesome comp in that neighborhood. And they're gonna use that and say, great, look at this one. But we break down and be like, nah, it's, it's, we're not gonna get 400,000. We think on average, and we're gonna err on the side of caution, and we say, hey, the, but look at these that sold for 350, 360, and we're gonna plug it in and say, hey, we think it's worth 360, and your $10,000 remodel is just unrealistic. It's very, very rare that we ever spend $10,000. On average, we spend $20,000 per house, and that's for a paint carpet cleanup. And so when we look at that is we don't buy very many, but there's a handful that we do. We do buy them, and we look at them all, and it's just a, a numbers game. I don't know, a couple hundred wholesaler deals that we do and we'll do two, you know? Uh, you know, we, we drive seven, 800 homes every month for trustee sale and we're gonna go buy eight or nine of them. A good month, we're 10, 11. And then we're gonna buy a uh, handful else on the online auctions, REOs, uh, and, and do a few others. So, and that's how we kind of hit our numbers and our volume. Uh, What's your favorite online auction site? They all have different, uh, um, 
So if you just look in sheer amount of volume, auction.fuck. Um, but they're also very, what's that? Auction.com. Yeah. Auction.fuck. Auction.fuck. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, .com. Um, but they're actually changing some of their things. And so the, the fact that we, because we are a VIP, we could bid on multiple, you know, but now they're coming back with their bid deposits and doing some other things. It, it's nuanced. And, and because there's so many that you can actually find some deals on there. Um, I mean, we, we use them all. I mean, we go through every single one. So, I mean, uh, Zoom or Exomi or whatever, whatever they call that one now. It used to be Hudson and Marshall and now it's, or it's Genesis and then Hudson and Marshall and ServiceLink, um, RealtyBid. Um, I mean, we, we troll all of them, all of them all the time. And that's actually where we try to, to you know, sift through and it takes a, a lot of doing those. I mean, we bid on probably several hundred a month and we get maybe a few. Okay, guys, I'm going to wind this down because uh, you really talked a lot today and didn't, <laughs> didn't even take a drink of water. And uh, job, we, could probably, we could probably sit here all night, but uh, we'll, maybe we'll do another event with this guy and we'll kind of dive deeper. But I think this was a lot of information. I know we can only sit still for about an hour. Clap your hands and uh, thanks for coming. So I want to actually, so if there's other questions, as far as I didn't get a chance to, to address them, uh, harris-bay.com is our website. So my email is jake at harris-bay, B-A-Y.com. So you're, you're welcome to shoot me an email anytime. Uh, I do travel quite a bit, but uh, you know you can send it there. I do read through most everything that I get. And specifically just put this Thrive REIA -E -E on there. Um, and I'll, I'll make sure that where my assistant or somebody looks at them and starts archiving them so then I can get back to you. Um, anything that I can do to help you out, again, that's, that's you know, part of the thing. You know, listen, Bo is awesome. And so anything I can do to help him out, and then all, all you guys, that if you're part of Bo, and so give Bo a hand, and we appreciate him putting this together.